Okay, I'm back from China. You're back from Taiwan. Uh, what's going on, Lindell? Uh, Haswell E's out. I'm gonna do a video on Haswell E and why you should or shouldn't. Uh, I don't know. I've been testing it. I got a 6800K and a Xeon. And because um, if you're gonna spend $1,700 on a CPU, why wouldn't you get a Xeon? I mean, it seems silly though, because it's like, ha, huh, Intel, I'll show you. I'll not buy the $1,700 desktop part. I'll buy the Xeon from you instead. <laughs> <laughs> You know something? <laughs> so I, I met some Intel guys uh, in, in Taiwan. And they were like, oh, well, well, so uh, what do you think of the new CPUs? What, what, what are you going to get? What are you going to get? And I was like, uh, I'm grabbing the Xeon. And all of them at the same time were like, oh, man, we all work for the i7 group or whatever. The, we're, we're in the desktop, whatever. And I was like. Well, don't charge $1,700 for a CPU and then we'll talk. <laughs> exactly. So should we talk about the engineering samples that we've acquired or no? Should we just do a video uh, what, and be like, and be like, hmm. Yeah, so. You, well, you shouldn't buy engineering samples because they're not necessarily going to be supported, but we did so we could get some uh, benchmark comparisons. You can do the OEM version. The OEM version is fine, and the retail version is fine. It just so happens that there's a 10-core part, I mean a 12-core part, at approximately the same cost as the 10-core part with five more megs of cache, same clock speed, uh, similar parameters as the top-end i7. And this is crazy because usually it is you get the Xeon for more the desktop part shouldn't be approximately the same plot price and the the xeon is slightly more recommended price from intel but the truth is that oems people that buy the cpus in quantity and build system servers from them yeah it's not it's it's just and so i've been doing benchmarking and messing around with it and we're going to do an itx build um we've got a uh, one of the fractal, one of the Bill Owen fractal cases. We're going to do a build for a video, and then we're going to give away the case. We're not going to give away the whole machine, but we're going to give away the case. And so there's going to be details of that contest coming up. But yeah, uh, got a got a uh, 14 core Xeon, I think, also, which is a lower clock speed. But we're going to overclock the Dickens out of it and see what we can do with it. <laughs> and then we've also got a, a 12 core Xeon. So we're doing some experiments, and the results have been really interesting. We also got a 6800K. And basic back of the envelope benchmarking with the 6800K, I have been able to overclock it to 4.3 gigahertz. It's just random retail. We just, you know, ordered it to see what happens. 6800K is basically the same speed as the 3930K at stock speeds from previous generations. So it's 3.4 gigahertz versus 3.3, you know, instructions per clock gain. Intel says about 5%. I would say it's 5% or less um, for, you know, at least as far as Cinebench is concerned. Um, so if you've got a 3930K, it's about equivalent to a 6800K, but I have been able to overclock the 6800K to 4.3 gigahertz. The interesting thing with the overclock on these is that you can push them to about 4 gigahertz, and then when you push them past 4 gigahertz, the amount of heat goes way up, but the stability and the gains doesn't actually go up much. So you hit, you just sort of find a find a spot on your CPU where it's like, hmm, I pushed it up a little bit more, and now the heat output is insane. And I'm not really seeing any kind of stability. I'm not really seeing any kind of performance gains, even having overclocked it. But that's all going to be in a separate video. But good that's, lord, that's it's been a, pretty, a lot of work to do that. That's a pretty good argument for the Xeons, and the, the, because the Xeons, they, they've got most of, typically have more uh, cash. So I guess uh, I probably should have called you, but I bought uh, three Xeons <laughs> for the office, <laughs> these engineering samples. <laughs> but I couldn't pass it up because they're, they're, they're from uh, one. One was for sale in Maryland. That one's already in the mail. Checks out, everything's good. I was like, holy crap, so I got a 12 core there for like 350. Normally these things are like the retail for you know 2000. It's the one with 35 megabytes of cache, a uh, smart cache. Um, and it also had, it, it turbos up to 3.6. And then I saw the, the one from uh, Hong Kong, the 20 core. I decided to check out the 20 core with 45 megs of cache because it was 500. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, hmm, 500 for the 20 cores. The turbos to the turbos to three point five or three point six somewhere in that same range is like the the, the extreme i seven, or I could spend seventeen hundred on the extreme i seven. Do I want twenty cores, forty threads, or do I want ten cores, twenty threads? <laughs> hmm. Well, see, such a difficult the, decision. The thing you got to the thing you got to be careful though about is that uh, the clock speed on that Intel fiddles with the clock speed, and so the one that I picked up, which was. Um, no, it, the one that I picked up was the 2687W, the Xeon 2687W. You can pick those up from OEMs, especially if you're friends with an OEM or you're friends with a system builder. Uh, you can pick those up for fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars The 2687W is um, a workstation part, ostensibly. It's not a server part. That's 12 cores, but its stock clock is 3 gigahertz. And so like yeah, the... Yeah. 
Uh, the 14 core part, I think, is 2.1 gigahertz. Now it'll turbo, but it's not going to turbo to like 3.5, 3.6 gigahertz, especially on all the cores. Yeah. Um, but you can, with base clock fiddling, at least until Intel locks the microcode down, which they're probably seeing this video and they're probably dispatching <laughs> an army of flying engineers to, uh, you know, like the flying monkeys from The Wizard of Oz. That's the <laughs> mental picture you should have, flying engineers to lock down the microcode so that you can't do that anymore. But uh, do not, you got to be careful. You can't buy engineering samples necessarily. So like on Asus boards, for example, uh, they don't support engineering sample CPU. So if you try to use an engineering sample CPU with an Asus board, it's not going to post. I ran into that with three or four different models. Other models, it works. But, you know, again, you don't necessarily get a microcode update. You don't necessarily know what you're getting. Technically, engineering sample CPUs are not even really supposed to be sold. Uh, but OEM versions of the CPU are okay. And so like the OEM version of the uh, 2687W, um, you can get pretty easily uh, for fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600, which is a little less than the i7. And that's a 14 core CPU, five megs of L, L, uh, L3 cache. Now, how, what's, what's cache good for in terms of megahertz? Well, I don't know, except to tell you that uh, working on um, a thing with uh, Eric S. Raymond, basically just doing some testing for him, um, working with uh, Repo Surgeon and working with uh, uh, some other tools there. Uh, for one particular large workload, five megs of cache was good for about four or 500 megahertz of clock speed. So having five more megabytes of cache was equivalent to a clock increase of about four or 500 megahertz if you were comparing apples to apples for this one particular workload problem. I mean, I made sure that all the ones I got had a frequency advantage over the i7 or at least were close. So it'll be interesting to see how these things stack up. Um, you know, we always wonder why does Intel uh, never support us? And, and I think um, maybe we should just- uh, I don't think uh, they supported anybody. Like know? Linus had to, I, I saw Linus had to uh, like tweet angrily like five or six times. And then finally, a few days later, he's like, our tray of CPUs finally came in. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> So I tweeted, um, someone was like, hey, are you guys going to do a review of the new Intel CPU? And so I tweeted uh, uh, online and I said, uh, I don't know, um, uh, we don't have any uh, parts. And I just tagged Intel. And Intel responded with something I thought was funny, but it, it turns out I think they were being snide with, uh, we do not give out free samples of our CPUs unless you are an educational thing. We are very sorry and all this stuff. And I was like, and I wrote back and I was like, oh, well, speaking of educational, we're doing an educational video on how to get um, CPUs to test motherboards, to test X99 motherboards. And they wrote back with like another thing where like, we are very serious about not giving a CPU out, you know, like, and then Dimitri jumps in and was like, wow, this is an interesting conversation. It's just, I'll post a link to it. It was really funny because I thought Intel was joking, but I think they were not joking. So uh, I thought they were just having a little fun. Oh, well. This. Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll uh, Intel enjoy our videos on all the Xeons. About it. Well, I mean, if you had a machine that would turn sand into dollars, would you just hand it out either? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're like, they know that every motherboard manufacturer, Gigabyte and NMSI and EVG and everybody, they're all like throwing these X99 motherboards at all the different reviewers out there. I don't, we haven't got, I mean, we got one, I think, so far. Um, but they know that they're all going to have to have a CPU. So they're like, they're going to have to buy it anyway. Let them buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening right now. We got the, we got the Skylake CPU with the, you know, with the promotion, the one Skylake CPU, that was pretty cool. But yeah, most of the time, I think Intel leaves it up to the OEMs. I think yeah. the, the OEMs get their scratch and dent CPUs. But you know, one thing we were able to do, so with Gigabyte, Asus, and ASRock, um, we've gotten a ton of intelligence from them because even though we don't have the CPUs, uh, when we were in tai uh, tai Taipei and uh, the last couple of weeks, I've actually been gathering intelligence from their engineers. And I've got some really great write-ups from those companies on the CPUs that they have, because they have hundreds of CPUs that they use for their internal testing. And so when we do the, uh, when we do the video, um, I will talk a little bit about the general trends from that because they provided, they're very kind and they provide statistics on how overclockable the CPUs are and what sort of stats they've encountered and so on and so forth. And don't want to spoil it too much for you, but the, uh, the 6,800 and you know, uh, the 6,800 and on up, the general trend is four to 4.3 gigahertz is about a 50% chance uh, that you would be able to hit that. More than 4.3 gigahertz is a little bit more rare. 4.5 gigahertz is uh, starting to get into Silicon Lottery country. Uh, 4.5 gigahertz in that neighborhood is Silicon Lottery. You know, you've won the Silicon Lottery. More than 4.5 gigahertz, it's just going to be, uh, you know, it's just going to be amazing. 
but you can provide clock and voltage to the cores individually. And also with Broadwell E, uh, Intel has a quote unquote favorite core. So Intel is actually doing some kind of a process before the processors leave the factory to find which of the six or eight or 10 cores uh, or 12 cores or whatever. No, well, not 12 cores, but uh, the six or eight or 10 cores are the most overclockable. And then they label that the quote unquote favorite core. And then when the thing is turboing and, and doing all the other stuff with the Intel Extreme Turbo Boost 3.0 or whatever it is, um, then that core is the core that gets the higher clock speed while the other cores are not necessarily doing anything, which is interesting because <laughs> Intel is basically not just bending them during the assembly process, but bending them after they've been completely assembled, which is really interesting, I think. And so it's been fun to talk to the engineers about the different odd edge cases that they've encountered and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Also been testing the Asus Strix X99 with the 6800K and its auto overclock utility uh, got it up to 4.3 gigahertz on all cores. It was completely automated. Like I just set it and left it and it did a burn-in test for like an hour. And I was like, okay, I guess, it, is it done? I don't know if it's done. It was just, it was running, but uh, it, it got all four or it got all six cores up to 4.3 gigahertz on the 6800K. So neat. I just get down to, uh, that was the Intel segment, put that at the beginning. Uh, we'll have you know some Intel coverage coming up soon, but let's go ahead and get down to the matters at hand. I'm going to be going over to Paris for Viva Technology. And that's going to be in Paris on the uh, just a few days, from the 30th to, the, to uh, July 2nd. Now, this event, uh, I want you guys to stay tuned for some of the content because one of the main reasons I want to go check this out, other than the fact that they called me and said, hey, do you want to come to Paris? And I was like, yeah, that'd be really cool. And they said, hey, do you want to speak on stage? And I was like, oh, that'd be great. I'll just get up there and take my clothes off and never be invited back. But it'll be really good because that's how I'm going to get famous. See? See? <laughs> <laughs> now, every, the whole world will be talking about this guy who's like a weirdo on YouTube who got on stage, who was invited to Paris, strangely, and got on stage at this event and took off his clothes. Do not hope they're not watching this right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, see what happens. Oh, that <laughs> wacky American humor. It's not serious. Ha 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 ha. It's kind of like it's kind of like British humor, <laughs> but with um, not with, with, without as many uh, uh, French jokes. They really don't seem to. I don't know. Never mind. <clears throat> so what's happening is they've got five five thousand startups. They're expecting like thirty thousand entrepreneurs to be there, and then they've got a ton of venture capitalists. They put them all in a room. People, there's speeches that go on. And we find out, you know, a lot about what's going on. There's a lot of discussion about future technologies, how they're going to impact businesses and society. And you never know what's going to come out of it because when you put venture capitalists with entrepreneurs in a room, ah, magical things happen. So we may get a look at some of the trending technologies of the future by going and hanging out here at this event, hearing some of the talks. Uh, but we'll also get sort of a broad picture of the general impact on new technologies and new innovations in society. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. So that's the... The Viva Technology thing. Stay tuned for videos on that. Moving up next. Oh, this is something we could probably do a Rant 30 segment on, but I think that should be a separate segment with more research. But Europe is about to create a link tax. And they've already been doing something like this in France. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of France, and, <laughs> and speaking of France loving technology. Oh, I shouldn't have put this article next. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but I'm sure the people at the Viva Technology are not for this. So what's happened to the politicians in France? And uh, across the EU, they want to do this, but it's already kind of happening in France. They looked at all the links because um, a lot of the big newspapers were having a hard time competing. And we saw this in America with the New York Times and, and Wall Street Journal and all this sort of thing. Like, oh, profits are down. Everyone's reading all their news on the Internet. We don't know how to adapt to new technology because we are an old company. And then they freak out and they're like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? we gotta, <coughs> we got to shut down these other companies. Well, in France, what they decided to do was – create a link tax. And this was mainly for, let's say, Google looks at your website or looks at, uh, you know, maybe a, a French news, just for instance. We'll just, we'll just do it with Americans. I'm not sure of a big French news web or um, news thing off the top of my head, but the New York Times. So every time Google lists a New York Times article with a blurb, um, New York Times wants to get paid for that, like a few pennies. So they want to, they want Google to pay for the privilege of listing their content. But, I mean, let's think about this. Google is where you go to find the news. So it just doesn't make any sense because Google is sending them traffic. Google's doing them a favor. Google's sending people their way, but they're like, yeah, we'd like you to pay us for sending people our way. Huh. And that's kind of what they're I doing in France. It's weird. <laughs> they're, they're they're trying to encourage a Brexit, <laughs> but uh, the I think this is already the, this way in Spain as well. And Google was just like, okay, you know what? Google News, Spain? Nope, we're just gonna turn that off. Yeah, no, they went no more nuclear. Google News in Spain. Like, 
Yep, that's a nuclear option. <laughs> it's turned off. <laughs> Gone. I don't know. It's kind of, I mean, I could see an illiterate point of view would be like, hey, publishers need to get paid for this. But at the same time, the publishers can control exactly what search engines do. They can use robots.txt to create an entry on their website that says, hey, search engines not allowed because they're not going to get paid by search engines. But they won't do that because that would be shooting themselves in the foot as far as traffic goes. So I think this is this is a little unusual. I think that, that newspapers haven't figured out how to properly monetize the traffic being sent to them by search engines. And that's the root problem. And it's like, well, Google is not going to monetize your traffic for you. Google is monetizing their own, like their business model is the search. And once the, it's handed off to you guys, it's up to you guys to figure out how to monetize it. I mean, this, this is a, a tough situation, especially with things like ad block and you know, it's sort of a race to the bottom in terms of costs. So you've got to have an insane amount of traffic or you've got to have, I mean, certainly our own ad revenue has, you know, cratered off a cliff for those kind of things. So, yeah, I mean, I feel publishers pain, but that's not really Google's problem. Yeah. So I, I kind of would like to do, a because uh, the, the European Union um, is thinking about making, and Germany's been thinking about this for a while. I'd like to look into why they're thinking about this because i'm sure the politicians don't just sit around in their house and 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 sip tea and think damn it you know the the newspaper industry and the news industry they need to make more money what can we do that's not the way this went down they don't have time to think about the trivial nonsense like that because that's not their job their job is to take care of the citizenry of their country and the safety and all that stuff i'm telling them what their job is and i'm going to do these things yeah um but someone somewhere must have showed up and be like hey we're having a problem here we're a major staple in society and we can't make ends meet because these online behemoths like google are just showing all of our content in their search results and they're not even paying us for all the content that they're showing and never mind the fact that they're sending people to our website so i think there's something like that went on behind the scenes and i like to do a little bit more research and possibly put together a little rant 30 segment because uh, the news is important but um, and monetization is important, yes. But this is a totally backwards way of doing it, and it would. Uh, well, you know what? It may this may hurt some of the big players, but some of the independent news sources won't be hurt as much. Hmm. That's another way to look <laughs> at that's it. That's why no one in Spain has heard of us. <laughs> Ugh, that's sad. All right, uh, moving right along. Then let's. Uh, oh, Epic Pants. Check this section out. Our shirt of the month right now, guys. Um, we sold a few of these. Haven't sold as many as I thought. Dennis. Richie. Does everybody know who that is? Because maybe that's why it hasn't sold so much. I'm wearing the shirt right now. Quite enjoy it. So Dennis Ritchie, he passed away at around the same time as Steve Jobs, and no one seemed to give a shit. And I was like, what's going on with that? Why Why? why are everybody oh. talking about Jobs? But not as many people. I, I mean, in, in certain circles, but no one seemed to say mention Ritchie as much. He invented well, C. Well, for the readers, for the readers on the, uh, in the audience, if you're not familiar with, uh, I think it's Reflections on Trusting Trust is the name of the paper. You should go read the paper. Uh, let, me, let me just make sure that's right. Yeah, so he he came up with the uh, the operating uh, uh, the operating system Unix, and here's some of the I believe this is the parser code floating beside his head here on the picture. We I decided to put some of that in there, sort of his uh, you know the the spirit of his work floating there beside him. Um, and then there's some I'll tell you this there's there are some <coughs> some secret bits of code hidden in the ASCII art. So we have a little <laughs> fun with with Dennis uh, it, Dennis Ritchie here. It's it's. It's Thompson and Ritchie. Thompson, yeah, Thompson, Thompson and Ritchie. And, and Thompson wrote the reflections on trusting trust, but you know Ritchie was right there as well. And so Thompson and Ritchie see programming language the whole nine yards, and you know he died. So ASCII art, woo. Um, yeah. So I think the irony here but, is that you know they yeah. passed away at the same time as Jobs, and everyone mentioned Jobs, but Jobs would have had no job at all. <laughs> there would be no Jobs at Apple. Period. <laughs> if it wasn't for Ritchie, because he came up with C and Unix and uh, a lot of the. Stuff from I mean I mean fr freaking OS the the the, the operating system for uh, Apple is pretty much based on Unix so yeah there's a really great uh, <coughs> there's a really great video on YouTube called uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie explain Unix from Bell Labs it was uploaded in 2011 but it was recorded in the 1980s and you should you should watch that to know who they are um, they're 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 the guys I have to find that link um, and throw it in the description for you guys. Um, also, I want to mention, we, pardon me, <clears throat> the mouse sold out. Got a thousand sold out. Do you guys want more? Because if we make any more, I'm going to make a couple of refinements and maybe a couple of small changes, possibly a 3366 sensor in there as well. If you guys want that for three or four dollars extra, let me know. 
what we want to do, but they won't be coming out immediately because we have to pay our taxes. <laughs> and, and then we can make more. So, I mean, we didn't, as you know, the price of the mouse, we didn't make a ton of money on those. We made enough to eat and sort of fill in the blanks since we have a lack of content due to the lack of office right now. But that's all about to be mitigated, and you guys are keeping us alive by supporting us through the store and also through Patreon. So thanks to all of our Patreon members. Thanks to everybody in the store. But I use this as kind of a, an excuse to chit-chat about Dennis Ritchie for a minute because uh, it's always good to remember. All right, moving right along. The U.S. Navy is talking about the mark of the beast, y'all. How about that? They're discussing plans to fit humans with microchips and track their every move, according to some 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 people here in the world. In the, in the, in the world, uh, actually, according to Zoltan Istvan. How this guy? How how is it fair that he was born with a sci-fi name? It's not fair. <laughs> and and now he's doing trans. Sci-fi or German? Uh. Uh, <laughs> you decide. We'll have a list of names. You can decide if they're sci-fi or German. Um, but he's a transhumanist. <laughs> How, how is he so lucky to have the name Zoltan Istvan as a transhumanist? I'm probably mispronouncing it, but anyway. So the um, he's, he's worked. He, he he says that everyone should have an, an interface so that they can upgrade their brain. You know, like he wants that for the future. I mean, it's a, maybe a far future in the next couple of decades or whatever. But he wants that. He wants us to be able to upgrade and augment ourselves. He's um, one, of, one of the I guess visionary transhumanists. There he is. He's also uh, wants to run for president in the USA. I guess I don't know. But the Navy has been coming to visit him and talk about, hey, um, let's talk about, like, you know, tracking people and uh, implanting chips and that sort of thing. Uh, so he, he's, he's mentioned that they've been there planting, and that, that plants a seed. Could the Navy be looking into, you know, tracking chips like they have with dogs and, and uh, cats and, you know, the stuff, like in, it, stuff that is in, like, Kane's hand, the mark of the beast that you all freaked out about um, uh, back when? Now— they're already using these sort of tracking devices in, um, I guess, military personnel. So they, number one, they want to make sure that military personnel do not have access to unauthorized implants. So because they don't, they don't want them there with an unauthorized implant. So they want to find the right scanning technologies to make sure people don't have implants and stuff. Uh, and then on top of that, they want to. They've already been chipping military personnel, but now they're talking, you know, about just just loosely like, what would it be like if we chipped everybody so we could really, you know, figure out what's going on. And we can take that a step farther in the next couple of articles, but uh, I mean, there's no concrete thing here that says, yes, they're going to put a chip in everybody, but they did talk about it. And the U.S. Navy is not the U.S. government, but they are a branch of the military. So, yeah, someone's knocking on this the door. This is kind of, I mean, this is, with like cell phones and stuff like that, this, this is kind of already happening in terms of tracking, but the... You know, what kind of technology do we have to be able to track and record the movements of every citizen everywhere? Uh, we already have the technology. It's already there. It already exists. It already is being uploaded to the cloud. You got an iPhone? Guess what? Apple knows everywhere you've been. Don't believe me? Uh, Google it. Years ago, uh, there was a, somebody discovered a text file in the root of their iDevice when they rooted it. And uh, it had a history of everywhere they'd ever been with the device. If you don't believe that that hasn't been uploaded to Apple, you are very naive. <laughs> yeah, really. They, uh, they didn't. They didn't turn it off. They just encrypted it, so it's still there, still tracking you, still doing stuff. And uh, you know, and now Facebook wants the same thing. Hmm. How about that? Who would have thought that Mark Zuckerberg would have wanted to know more personal information about you? I never would have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> So if you have the Facebook app installed, Mark Zuckerberg wants to start using the lo- – if you have the Facebook app installed and locations turned on, he wants to start using that to create a, uh, you know, basically a map of your life. He wants to know when you go to the grocery store. He wants to know where you go. He wants to know, you know if you go to the mall. Uh, he wants to know, he wants which to know what you, you hear to. Yeah, because the microphone's always on. Mm-hmm. So – and I think it's weird that people are just kind of okay with this. They use Facebook. I do not install Facebook on my phone. I never will. Not happening, period. Uh, hey, I, I, want, I want to see something mess work. Want to? Hey Google, find me a Range Rover. <laughs> you guys enjoy your weeks of Range Rover ads. <laughs> hey Siri, look up Blue Waffles. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, we had to get serious right there. So uh, you know that was what was that? What kind of a transition was that? I sounded like. Uh, Uh, Rick from Rick and Morty. Um, (laughs) So, Mark Zuckerberg, he's also dead keen on reading your thoughts. Within 50 years, it says, "Uh, Hey, Morty. uh, uh." (laughs) 
<laughs> I, th- I saw a comment like that that was like, "Oh, if you if you if you had an alcohol problem and burped more, uh, it would uh, you know you would be totally uh, Morty. No, you'd be totally be Rick from Rick and Morty." <laughs> and uh, it was like, you know, when we were driving around Taipei, I'm pretty sure that I saw your check liver light on. So <laughs> I only had two beers in Taipei, and they were one percent alcohol. Just, but it's just the gas. So <laughs> at this point, <laughs> uh, anyway, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, there's a little essay he wrote here, but. We have, I've read it yesterday. I have to go back through it. But some of this is really interesting because he starts to talk about looking at technology now and then talking about the near future and things we can do. He's like, well, right now we have VR. We could we could look at and see what you guys are doing with VR, but that's not all. That's not enough. We, like, you know, humans, they want to share. And he's like, we want to know from you and learn from you by your thoughts. And then he starts talking about, oh, there's some interesting technology that's being developed, you know, at Berkeley. Team at Berkeley, they're working on uh, an MR, MRI that can do brain imaging. And they can say, oh, we can tell what you're thinking by this. And they've, they've, and he also mentions that they've done some studies with rats where they've, a rat's gone through a maze, and then they take that rat, and they're able to extract his memories and put them into another rat, and then that rat can essentially go through the maze. And he's thinking about the future implications, maybe 10, 20 years, of what that's going to be like if we are able to implement that as far, you know, for humans. And we have to have much faster technology, like a device that's in your room that you can just think, oh, I wish the lights were on, and then they come on. If it's a Sabbath and you're Jewish and you have an implant, does that count if you think, I wish the lights were on and they come on? Did you actually do any work? Think about that, Jewish people, and get back to me. Is that racist? No. I don't think so. Anyway, um, so he's talking about, like, all of this stuff. He wants to be inside your head, and he, it, it sounds like he really wants to know your thoughts. He's writing it in, like, a, a sort of a, you know, nice, interesting way. Like, you know, this is all straight out of the Matrix, right? Question mark, he says. Is it really that far off, you know? Is, is, is No one's doing this on humans, but um, is it in the future? You know, these are all things that from his thing. He's, he, he's, you know, even, he does mention that there's ethical questions, but a lot of times we bring, he brings stuff like that up to make himself sound softer. He always likes to sound like a hero. Like if you look in India when he was trying to bring his free internet, quote-unquote free internet, he was always like, I'm a hero, I'm a savior, I'm a messiah character. So he always will try to play a role that sounds... He always is soft, and but he really wants one thing, and he wants all of your data, all of your all of your thoughts, so that he can deliver that information to companies that will pay lots of money. So, it's a pretty interesting thing. This might also be worth another video as well, just talking about do we have, you know, brain scans in our future in the fifty years? I don't know. Move right along. Should we talk about Bluetooth five? There's some exciting things going on with Bluetooth 5. So Bluetooth 5, you get um, four times the range and two times the speed. So increase all that. But there's a huge implication here, and that's for the Internet of Things. The new Bluetooth technology allows Bluetooth devices that are not paired to send very small packets of information back and forth between uh, one another. So you can walk into a room, the entire thing can be full of Bluetooth. And in the background, all the Bluetooth devices are like, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? Hey, your clock's wrong. Let me help you with that. Oh, you know, like <laughs> that kind of stuff. That that can be, that's now a thing. So there's security implications, number one. Tracking implications, number two. And then convenience and Internet of Things implications, number three. You want to jump in and chew on any of these? Or I don't really know if there's much to say about it other than um, what, what conversations come out of it. The uh, So what, this is actually kind of a fix uh, for a problem that, um, so Apple did something clever with the whole airdrop thing, which I think runs over Wi-Fi. Um, it's really like, if you, unless you have paired devices, they can't really exchange information, so you have to pair your device to do stuff. But with things like airdrop, you just show up, and it's like, hey, I just want to, I just want to give this file to this other device or give this to this other thing. And so it's a little, uh, it's a little different. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, it's, it's the advertising packets are 47 bytes in size and 31 can be used for data. Um, but we don't know how large the packets are going to be in Bluetooth five, according to the article, but we're hoping that the packets will be a little bit larger so that you can exchange more information about a device before you pair with it. Um, this is actually not surprisingly, this is actually not something that historically has been part of the the Bluetooth protocol and, you know, pairing for what is otherwise a transient connection, meaning that, you know, you're, you, somebody has their phone and you have your phone and you just want to send them a file, but you don't want to send it over the internet. You just want to transfer it locally, which makes a lot more sense for video and things like that. Uh, you're in a situation where you have to pair 
on the Bluetooth side of things, but with, you know, Wi-Fi, especially Wi-Fi, like a direct Wi-Fi connection, you don't necessarily have to do that as long as it's handled at the software level. I like this because this is a hardware assist type of thing and a hardware assist type of things takes stuff more out of developers hands and more out of the software stacks hands so that if there are bugs with this they will get fixed as opposed to having a bug in an application that may be a security vulnerability that may not get fixed for years and so i like that the protocols are getting sophisticated enough that the developers don't have to worry about implementing a secure protocol i like that aspect of it but i also like that there's going to be range improvements and, and that sort of thing i'd say in the future we can wear a bluetooth tag and bluetooth stuff like this is sort of going to be the thing that powers you know a smart home that's not dangerously insecure and not super cloud dependent in terms of like being able to follow you around the house and set your preferences and that sort of thing so curious about all the internet of things stuff that comes out so but we we, we do need to get on uh, making our own home automation kit for everybody else that's that doesn't talk to the cloud. So, anyway, um, next up on the list here, the elderly may toss their walkers for this robotic suit. And I thought this was kind of an interesting article about uh, the, the, the um, it's called the Superflex. So, it's um, <laughs> it's basically a a suit that adds. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about this suit, there's there's some suits out there that like oh they give you super strength or they help you pick up large boxes or they help you walk with ease. This one, the Superflex. It learns your gait. It learns your movements. So after it learns your movements, it's able to better assist you. It knows when you're picking up your leg. It knows to give you a little extra boost or whatever. So this is something like this, instead of an elderly person walking around hunched over with a walker, uh, losing mobility, they'll be able to put on one of these. They cost, I believe, oh, it doesn't say exactly how much they cost. The $40,000 is the Phoenix suit that can help someone who's totally paralyzed. But um, can you imagine that, that you know, a future not too far off, a few years off, where elderly people, as long as they have access to health care insurance and can afford one of these, instead of hunching over, they'll just be walking around with uh, essentially exoskeletons. And we'll also see this with the military <laughs> for sure. Uh, uh, this this suit has uh, one of the first things that I've ever seen for these these kinds of, uh, I don't want to call it a prosthesis, but this, this sort of uh, mechanism. And that is that it learns the wearer's natural movements yeah. and then augments it. Typically with these kind of suits... We see that it has been engineered with, you know, a typical, you know, like a human hip joint and a typical human knee joint. And so this thing, it seems to suggest that it has been articulated in such a way that, you know, this, the suit can adjust to the natural, the wearer's natural movements and move in a way that is natural to the, to the wearer and assist. And so I think on that side, it's really good. But then on the other side, I think that, you know, only the super wealthy are going to have access to this first and then I've, I've got three words that come to mind that is just really terrifying and makes me want to proceed with this technology cautiously and that is iron dick cheney <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite movie I mean, do we really want to give dick cheney a super suit i mean that's what this is going to come to <laughs> oh god <laughs> i'm pretty sure i saw the chronicles of dick cheney in a super suit in that one movie it was like the wolverine movie where wolverine you know he didn't. He had like his bone claws or something. I don't know. It was the it was the movie. It was the Marvel movie about Wolverine. It was the old guy in the mech suit. That's where this technology is going. Except it's going to be Dick Cheney piloting the mech suit. Otherwise known as it's probably going to be Satan. bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's like this. He's like I'll just fly to Iraq and take him out myself. And it's like whoa whoa whoa. Calm down, Iron Dick Cheney. Calm down. I really want It'll Iron. Be fine. Dick, I want an Iron Dick Cheney. Doom mod. I'm not talking about new Doom. I'm talking about old Doom. Doom 2. I want an iron... Uh, he needs to be like... Uh, <coughs> or even Wolfenstein. Replace Hitler with Iron Dick Cheney. And we'll call him Mon Satan. <laughs> It'd be perfect. I don't know. Iron Dick Cheney could replace that uh, rocket goat thing in Doom. That would be okay. The rocket I mean, it's basically goat. the same thing. You'd only have to change a few pixels. <laughs> <laughs> the cyber <laughs> demon... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, do do do, killing demons. Doo, doo, doo. Hey, Dick Cheney, what's going on? Oh, you working on a merger down here? Business deal? What's going on? Oh, you're trying to kill me with rockets? Oh, that's oh. not good. Yeah, you could you could just totally leave the horns and everything. It's all it's all good. <laughs> just have to make it a little a little girthier. I mean, the, the, the cyber demon's ripped. <coughs> God, I'm dying here. It's just painted on with a sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
let's talk about some science now that this has gotten out of hand. And then we've got a bunch of E3 stuff to talk about, and then we're done for today. But um, So some, a team of scientists in Germany have developed a way to transform infrared light into visible light using a compound that they've created. And here's the compound I'm highlighting. Oh, I've got the wrong thing on the screen. Highlighting on the screen right here. So, <coughs> pardon me. Now, with this, the, the main takeaway here from this is that, yeah, it's really cool that you, now that this compound can filter infrared light into visible light, and it does so at about the 2900 Kelvin rating, so um, that's kind of on the colder side of light, I guess. Is that right? The colder side? Yeah, I don't know. It's backwards when you're doing film. Um, no, it's lower. It's warmer. I don't know. You guys let me know in the comments. I'll fix it. But, but it creates extremely directional light, which could be very good for industrial applications uh, um, and possibly microscopes and that sort of thing. So this could be an interesting breakthrough for, for some future stuffs. Yes. We included this because it doesn't seem like it would be possible on the surface. Infrared light naturally has uh, lower energy than visible light. And so it seems counterintuitive that it's like, oh, we're going to go from a lower energy state of photons to a higher ener energy state of photons. Uh, it's, it's really easy to go the other way. Well, not really easy, but fairly easy to go the other way. But in this case, uh, you know, the, the infrared energy, the infrared light is being converted into energy and then back into photons uh, in an efficient process inside a crystal. And so from a physics standpoint, that's kind of interesting and kind of unusual. It's a bit over my head, uh, and therefore it proves the existence of God. So let's move right along and talk about gravitational waves. They've been detected for the second time. We've actually been, we have detected gravitational waves. This is. Yeah, we talked about head. this the first time they were detected. And, and it was like, holy crap, two. we have a new tool for studying the universe. And now we've got sort of confirmation that, hey, we've detected an another set of gravitational waves, which is awesome. I mean, what it took to, to, to I guess, uh, for us to see these gravitational waves, you have to think about the size of a black hole. I mean, the smaller black holes are like, you know, 100 times the mass of the sun into an area the size of Manhattan. And then you've got some of the bigger black holes that are like, Two billion masses of the sun, and they're huge, huge, huge. So a couple, a couple of these. I'm not sure what size these black holes were. I'm not sure. I have to look up and see the exact black holes and figure out what they, uh, what the mass was. It might be in here. Eight, eight times the mass of the sun. Fourteen and eight times the mass of the sun. So they're not, they're not the biggest black holes. But it took that much mass colliding to create gravitational waves that we could detect. Extreme circumstances produce extreme phenomena. Do 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 do. Yeah, when we reported on this last time, uh, we were they, you know, there were two detectors and the, the two detectors on planet Earth, and we were ba basically able to tell roughly what part of the sky that came from. There's this article talks about a third detector, a third gravitational wave detector, uh, which will be in Europe that will be online. And the more detectors that we get online, the better resolution that we're going to have until we basically have, you know, a planetary sized device that is uh, able to resolve gravitational waves and then at that point we will have a fairly high resolution uh, tool to use to examine uh, you know examine the night sky to see events before even visible light gets here and then we can point our telescopes that way and sort of see what's 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 going on there so mergers of black holes or whatever this particular event occurred 1.4 billion years ago so that's sort of interesting as well that it's, you know, so far in the past. But hey, gravitational waves. The EM drive, you guys remember that from us talking about that a long time ago, hopefully. The EM drive was this, this crazy guy in the garage. That's how all these, the best stories start, right? There was this crazy guy in a garage. And <laughs> he just said, you know, to hell with Newton's third law, Newton's first law. I don't care about any of this stuff. I'm going to stick a microwave oven inside a, a, you know, an aluminum foil box. And by God, it's going to produce thrust. And that's pretty much what happened. So this guy... Made that's this every, thing. Well, that, that's, that's how every good and every bad story starts. <laughs> <laughs> in a world where microwave rate, you know, microwave ovens can be converted into rocket boosters. <laughs> no, uh, the, uh, the the guy uh, basically uh, it's, it, he put a microwave emitter in a a truncated <laughs> cone. So he basically has a metal cone that he's putting a microwave emitter in, and then he sealed the whole thing, and it's producing thrust. And that seems crazy because we don't know of a way of producing thrust, this kind of thrust, from electromagnetic radiation. And so there were all sorts of, you know, uh, guesswork, basically. But it seems like it's a violation of, um, uh, you know, uh, it seems like a con it's a violation of conservation of momentum because um, there's not, it's not expelling anything uh, like a rocket would. So when a rocket burns fuel, you know, when you have, when you have a flame, 
the energy is going in all directions and like the funnel on a rocket will direct that energy to, from the fire out the back. And so you are expelling particles and you're expelling stuff and you're burning fuel. Uh, in this case, we're just taking electricity and converting it into a tiny, tiny amount of thrust. But it's been controversial because it's such a small amount of thrust, it's hard to know if the thrust is caused by uneven heating of the apparatus or caused by the heating of air from having energy pass through it, so it has to be done in a vacuum. It's hard to know if it's just instrumentation error. A lot of people think that it really is instrumentation error, and it smells like you know instrumentation, like systematic error in the, in the, uh, in the apparatus because it is such a small amount of energy or a small amount of thrust but it's orders of magnitude more thrust than you would expect from something like taking an array of LEDs and strapping an array of LEDs, you know, to the back of a battery and trying to measure the thrust from that. You know, that actually does produce thrust because pho photons have momentum, but it's just such a, a vanishingly small amount of, 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 of uh, energy that could be, you know, because you're, you're expelling photons and photons have momentum but not mass and it gets complicated. Um, that, that that's not really useful. And we have solar cells where solar cells bounce a photon off of a solar cell. And so you get the maximum amount of momentum. So there's a paper that's pretty reasonable and easy to understand that says maybe this is not actually a violation of Newton's law. And the way that it explains that it may not be a violation of, of Newton's law is that we may actually be emitting photon pairs. And so what may be happening inside the chamber, because the electromagnetic radiation can't escape the chamber, because it's basically a Faraday cage, it's metal, uh, the particles can't escape, but the particles bouncing around in there get to the point where maybe there's a pair of, of particles that have no magnetic signature, no electromagnetic signature, and those can escape. And because of the shape of the, uh, because of the shape of the container or whatever, um, that is actually what's pr producing the momentum. And so then the question becomes, well, have we gotten into a situation where Unlike the LEDs, where you're, you're putting a lot of the energy in the LEDs, most of it is coming out as visible light, and a very little bit of it is coming out as momentum. Have we gotten to a point where, where the photons coming out of this EM drive are actually have maximized the amount of energy that's going into the momentum component of that equation? And if that's true, that's exciting because we didn't know how to do that before. You know, the photons do have a component of momentum, but it's just, it's vanishingly small. But if this device is a way of manipulating the amount of energy that actually goes into the momentum component of that, then yeah, we could actually be looking at being able to dump energy into momentum, uh, which is still not complete heresy as far as, you know, violation of known physical laws, but is also really exciting because we don't currently know how to do that. <laughs> with with apologies to science students in the uh, in, in the audience who have been like, oh god, he really screwed that up. Oh, it's just terrible. Hey, we know the date of the Steam Summer Sale. We're switching over to video game stuff right now, by the way. Thanks to PayPal, they have spilled the beans all over the floor. Delicious Scottish baked beans have been spilled on the floor, and there will be no Scottish breakfast this week. But now we know. Gavin's coming for my wallet. Help me. <laughs> the twenty third. Oh no, I've clicked on some things on Twitter. Uh, fine, I'll just click on the tweet. But yeah, 23rd. I've been enjoying the uh, uh, good old game summer sale. Picked up Butcher Bay. I had not played that one fully. I played a little bit of it. So everyone in the comments, I can hear them now. There's there's like a, the people who love Deus Ex are like one group. And then there's the people who love the Butcher Bay. And a lot of them are the same people who are like, what? It's better than most games. But it's not like Deus Ex who are like, the best game ever. But there's a, there's a clear group of people who love that game. And I can see why. It's quite a bit of fun. Anyway, Halo 6 is going to be coming to Windows 10. Huh? Microsoft first party games, they are dedicated to bringing them to their Windows 10 platform. Have we come full circle since Windows 95 and now we're back and they're, they care about gaming on the PC or is there something deeper going on here? Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? No. <laughs> I think that uh, Games for Windows Live is a tragedy and it should be, it's just, I, it, it is unforgiven. Uh, the whole GTA 4 experience with Games for Windows Live. I, I will never forgive Games for Windows Live. Games for Windows Live makes Origin look like Steam. That is, that needs to be a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Games for Windows Live makes Origin look like Steam. That is, that's deep. <laughs> that's like, wow. Okay. Um, the, yeah, I could say a lot about this too. We could make it We've already made our our Rant 30 video that you guys should go watch that just you know, Microsoft hates PC gamers or whatever. Uh, I'm standing by that. I think a lot of the stuff that they're going to be doing here is 
uh, is going to be negative for the PC gaming community. But we'll wait and see. All right, next up, speaking of, I don't know what we're speaking of, uh, Skyrim. There is a special edition coming out. There's a trailer down here that shows the Xbox and, you know, PlayStation versions. Let me get to the end of this here so you can see that. Come on. There we go. They've basically just added EMB effects, new lighting effects, new new water effects, uh, better foliage, ground cover, and uh, then they did a color grade to it. Volumetric god rays and whatnot. So a lot of this stuff uh, the PC gaming community has been enjoying for a while thanks to uh, EMBs, texture packs, and that sort of thing. But some of the new shaders do look nice. The water shaders look nice. I'm wondering if the new Legendary Edition will sort of run better than some of the third-party plugins and stuff. Could be interesting. Play mods on console. So that's also interesting that they've brought mods to console. Anyway, we'll have to see how that works when it comes out. Hopefully these will not be paid mods. And I don't like the fact that they have their own mod store or whatever. I, I don't know. We'll see. Better Welcome not be paid to the mods. family console people. Yeah. I still don't... <laughs> Welcome to the party. They're, not gonna, they're still not going to have... Um, like the Macho Man Dragons, Batman, Spider-Man. Not going to happen. I mean, that, that, that can't happen because it's licensed content. And they're not going to... That stuff is just... It, it runs rampant on the PC because it's like the freaking Wild West. We're riding around on horses shooting each other and enjoying <laughs> playing Skyrim with Spider-Man. So, yeah. Anyway, the new Legend of Zelda game is on PC Gamer. And I was like, why is this on PC Gamer? What's going on here? And they've said this is the most PC Nintendo game ever. And I hmm. looked at it, and I was like, wow, this really is. So the new Legend of Zelda game is um, it's open world, and it's huge. And it looks beautiful. And you can set things on fire, apparently? Then the fire will spread. I, you know, I'm going to show a clip of this, but Nintendo is going to take this video down. So I'll just skip through yeah, it. Yeah, you yeah, should. Just, no, we can't. Nope, nope, not showing a clip. We, we, just mentioning Nintendo is enough to get this video taken down. Just don't even, la, 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 la. No. No. Uh, <laughs> the Legend of Zelda, <coughs> pardon me. If you, there's a bunch of charts here if people like if we've got any st statisticians in the audience the legend of zelda was the most mentioned game in the show by a long shot and then battlefield one god of war you can guys can see Watch Dogs 2 was up there even though the first one was lame um that was interesting the the most mentioned company was microsoft so interesting stats there and there's zelda stuff all right, last but not least, I want to mention, um, i just throw, throw a mention out there to some guys who are making uh, or remaking Knights of the Old Republic, and they are just updating the graphics and that sort of thing. They're using a stupid placeholder model right now that looks really bad, but the new environments and lighting and, you know, fog and sparks and particle effects look really good. So hats off to those guys. If you have not played Knights of the Old Republic, it is a very good... Um, I, well, I guess it's what, what's what's something similar similar to Neverwinter Nights as far as the gameplay style goes, similar to uh, Baldur's Gate and other games like that. I forgot what style is, of game that it is. It is really customizable, it's an RPG. but I yeah. don't. It's not. I wouldn't quite. I wouldn't say that it's exactly like. It's really it's distinct. Like the engineering team that did this were inspired by a number of things, but they did a really good job making it unique and interesting within the Star Wars universe. I, I really. I mean. I think that that uh, Disney, I guess, is the company in charge of this now. God, that's that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> could do this and do it really well, and it would still be a very playable, very awesome game. To not change anything with the mechanics, just update the graphics and at least you know do a few other things. So this is really exciting. This game was a lot of fun, and the replayability of this game is really high because uh, you could do everything. I mean, you could be an evil droid, an, an evil assassin droid, or, you know, Jedi, or whatever you wanted to do. It was fine. One thing interesting about this, you just mentioned that you don't need to do anything. These guys actually are doing something. They're um, they're, they're remastering the original game, but they're adding new content, new worlds, missions. Uh, they're changing the HUD, inventory, items. They're basically redoing a lot of the game and adding a lot of the game. I wonder if, I wonder if Disney is going to jump uh, on this and, and, and crush it, or... If anyone from Disney is watching right now, why not call them up and be like, hey, guys, we are going to support you, and you guys can help us develop this game, and uh, we can release it, and you guys will get a paycheck. How's that? So if mm -hmm. Disney is thinking of crushing it, think of that first, because I think a lot of people are going to want to play this on multiple different platforms. There's some Sometimes dated graphics happen, are too I'll much for prediction. people. Mm -hmm. You have to have Knights of the Old Republic in order to run this, because it's a mod. And so I think that there will be a sales spike 
in sales of Knights of the Old Republic as people buy or rebuy it. And then Disney will be like, why are people buying this? Oh, God, somebody made a mod? Shut it down. Shut it down. So as soon as there's a sales spike, somebody will notice, and then Disney will shut it down because of the sales spike, which sounds like the most asinine backwards thing in the world, but that's usually how it plays out. Hmm. Speaking of asinine and backwards, I have no segue. I just wanted to say that. All right, well, I've said it now. Um, it's That's pretty much the end of the show, guys. Thanks to all our Patreon guys. You guys are keeping us alive. So thanks very much for that. There is some cool new content coming up. Um, I'm actually about to, sh- as soon as this is over, I'm going to shoot a quick video on getting screwed in China. I um, got, got really screwed <laughs> How in not China. to buy a box of nuts and screws. <laughs> <laughs> we went to like 20 different places looking for this. And I was mostly looking for external hard drives that, that had been like... There's a, there's two different things when you when you're in uh, uh, I'll I'll put it in the real video but you can find like a lot of a lot of times when you find something legit when you're looking at some of these cheapo stores it's parts that have been uh, scavenged and salvaged and and whatnot from other machines so I was looking for something like that couldn't find it and bought a a Western Digital drive that was fake. Oops. Hey, she was good. She was a good actress. Because I was like, we, 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 we haggled, and I looked at the price on Amazon, and I'm like, you are $2 over the price on Amazon. I'm leaving. And then she haggled 10 bucks lower, and I'm like, screw you. And I walked away, and she like chased me through the store, and she's like, all right, I'll give you an extra 5 bucks off. And I was like, <laughs> hmm. I was like, is that worth the risk? And I was like, my, here's my brain. Did. I was like, you know, even if I buy this and it doesn't work out, I can make a video about it and make my 50 bucks back. So I'm going to do that, and you guys are going to watch the video, and I'll pay for the stupid drive that I wasted money on, and I'll feel better about myself, but it has to happen. So stay tuned for that video coming up soon. And uh, we've got an end-to-win factory tour. got a lot tour. of hardware videos coming up. A lot of hardware sure videos. Just subscribe to the hardware channel, which is hopefully linked below. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, if you want to run the new CPU, you can run your old X99 motherboard. But, you know, it's really weird. I think that I'm more uh, – the I would be more compelled to get a new motherboard especially for features like Thunderbolt 3 uh, and fast charging USB type C that kind of thing uh, versus getting a new CPU I think if unless I got like the uh, the uh, the 28 lane CPU maybe I don't know but like if you've got an x99 CPU already there's no reason to upgrade but maybe replace your motherboard if you want some of the new features maybe but if you've got something older like you're rocking a you know an i5 2500 or an i7 2700. I, I like the new X99 stuff. It is really fast. It is relatively low power. I haven't had any problem hitting 4 gigahertz on the CPUs that I've tried, which admittedly is not a lot, but based on the intelligence from the other people, we're going to cover all that in hardware videos. So be sure to check those out. We'll see you guys there. We'll see you guys on the forum. Thanks very much, and uh, good night. It better be evening when you're watching this because I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>